The South Dakota prairie is a place to ponder the infinite. But along the vast plains, atop the boundless land, one acre here is different. Ringed with barbed wire, marked by a stone set in cement, it is a burial ground. But what ended here, in this square of earth, began far away and high above. 4-7 Bravo Alpha, Clarence follows. You're clear to the uh, Dallas Love Field. We the Jeff 6 departure, Vector Cross City then has filed. When Payne Stewart boarded Learjet N-47BA in Orlando, October 25, 1999, his career was newly rejuvenated. Just that February, he'd won at Pebble Beach, his first tour win in four years. And then in June, at Pinehurst, the final hole. Payne Stewart is the 1999 U.S. Open champion. Oh, my. The U.S. Open his third victory in a major. He also played a key role on the victorious U.S. Ryder Cup team in September. By any measure, a great year. Also, once known as a difficult personality, Stewart, 42 years old, had recently undergone a spiritual reawakening at the encouragement of his wife, Tracy, and two children, Aaron and Chelsea. The last couple of years of his life, he was not as arrogant, not as cocky. Uh, a little easier to, to be around, I think. His faith really, you know, took over the last couple years of his life. He had a peacefulness that he started playing with, and um, I guess that uptightness that uh, sometimes came across as arrogance went away. Stewart was heading from Orlando to Dallas that October day for meetings on a golf course he was helping to design in Frisco, Texas. Then, on to Houston and the season-ending Tour Championship. Five others were aboard the Lear that morning. Stewart's two business agents, Robert Fraley and Van Arden, golf course designer Bruce Borland, and the Lear's crew, Captain Michael Kling and co-pilot Stephanie Belligarig. The flight plan called for a course over the Florida Panhandle and then west to Dallas. Air traffic in Jacksonville requested a climb up to 39,000 feet. 047 Bravo Alpha Jack, center climb and maintain potable 390. 390, Just two minutes after that transmission, air traffic control noticed a problem. The small jet had drifted nine miles off its course. Controllers tried to contact the plane. November 47 Bravo Alpha contact Jack Center on 135.65. November 47 Bravo Alpha contact Jack Center on 135.65. I'm starting to get a lot of concern about what may be going on in, in the airplane. And a lot of different thoughts are racing through my mind. Uh, is somebody sick on the airplane? Is, you know, how many people are in the back? Do we have a flight crew problem? Do we have an airplane problem? Uh, at this point, we start thinking, well, we, we really need somebody to go up there and tell us what's going on. Shortly after 10 a.m., more than half an hour since the last radio contact with a Lear, an F-16 from Eglin Air Force Base outside Pensacola, Florida, was dispatched to chase the plane down and investigate. With N-47BA now hundreds of miles off course, with the FAA clearing a pocket of airspace around it, Chris Hamilton's F-16 caught up to the Lear over Memphis, Tennessee. I got probably the neighborhood of 50 to 100 feet uh, away from the airplane, close enough to do a good visual inspection to see what was going on inside. As I come in, obviously, as I get closer, then I recognize the fact that, yeah, there's uh, something wrong with the airplane. And it uh, looks like the uh, front to cockpit is uh, either frosted or uh basically condensed over. I can't see inside the, uh, in the cockpit. Hamilton's visual check confirmed controller's worst fears. The frozen windows meant the plane's pressurization system had failed. The people aboard were likely dead. The plane was flying on autopilot. Can you imagine you, you, you're on the highway and you pull up next to a car and you see everybody inside's asleep. Uh, and you recognize they're gonna drive off the end of the road and you, there's nothing you can do. For half an hour, 
Hamilton flew alongside the Lear, accompanying a ghost through the sky. Just before noon, F-16s from the Oklahoma Air National Guard in Tulsa caught up with the plane, replacing Hamilton. Soon after, through cameras mounted aboard the F-16s, the Lear could be seen streaking from left to right across the sky. We're not seeing anything inside. Could be just a dark cockpit, though. Uh, he is not reacting, moving, or anything like that. Uh, and he should be able to have seen us by now. Shortly after that transmission, news of the Phantom flight began to break. A pair of F-16 fighters from the Oklahoma Air National Guard have been scrambled to find a civilian Lear jet. My phone rang in my cart, and I picked it up, and it was a friend of mine calling, and he just said, I'm glad to hear your voice, which I thought was a strange comment. Um, and then he told me what was going on, that, they were, that the news had said there was a plane that left Orlando with a professional golfer on it. We are told that the F-16s have located it flying near Lincoln, Nebraska, and the occupants of the plane, we are told, are non-responsive. He had told me he was going to Dallas on Monday, so immediately I knew who it was, and it was a very sick feeling. Mike Hicks, Stewart's caddy for more than a decade, who'd flown to the Tour Championship the day before, was on the course in Houston when news reached him. My phone rings, it's uh, the pro at my club, and he said, something's going on with uh, Payne Stewart's airplane. I said, no, they're crazy. He says, no, there's some, they, there's a, they're showing it on TV right now and they think it's, it's Payne Stewart's plane. The Learjet continued to fly along a straight line, having already passed over Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee, Missouri, Iowa, without any signs of life aboard. And now millions were watching wondering when and where the flight would end. And at this rate, it would run out of fuel uh, about a half an hour from now, a little less than a half an hour from now. At 12.22, a pair of F-16s from the Air National Guard in Fargo, North Dakota, took off. At 12.54, they reached the small plane. In the windows, they saw the same ice and darkness. It was kind of an eerie feeling, because you just, uh, you know there's people in there, but you think that, no, there can't be people in there because yeah, it's just on autopilot. At 1.14 p.m., above the small town of Mina, South Dakota, more than a 1,000 miles north of its original destination, and less than four hours after takeoff, the pilots reported to regional air traffic control in Minneapolis. The Lear had started its fall from the sky. Minneapolis, the uh, target is descending. What's he doing? And he's doing uh, multiple aileron rolls. Looks like he's out of control. It looked like one engine flamed out first, uh, the right engine, and so it kind of started to roll to the right. Minneapolis requests uh, emergency de descent to follow the target. And it kind of turned over and uh, started spiraling down to the ground. Far below, John Hoffman was on his property in Mina with a group hunting pheasant when he looked up toward the sky. We saw these F-16s flying right over the top of us. Then all of a sudden, cars came out of Aberdeen, a town close by. Hundreds of cars came by right where we were hunting. And the ambulance came and a fire truck came and, and we knew something had happened. This is a special report from ABC News. A chartered jet plane, out of touch and drifting out of control for several hours, has reportedly crashed in Aberdeen, South Dakota. November 47 Bravo Alpha, with six frozen bodies aboard, fell eight miles from the sky to the earth. When it landed, the impact left a pit 40 feet wide, 30 feet long, and 10 feet deep. There was no fire because there was no fuel left to burn. The plane essentially disintegrated upon impact. I was suffering personally because I lost a friend and the tour lost a great competitor and a great personality. But more than anything, Tracy and Aaron and Chelsea were suffering and they're gonna carry that on the rest of their life. Five and a half years later, this one acre of prairie remains set apart. This is where the parents, the widows, and the children were left behind. Their loss marked by a stone, 
lifted from the crater where the plane hit the earth. On the stone's face, the names of those who perished, and above the names, a Bible psalm is carved, Psalm 40. It begins, He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my foot upon a rock and gave me a firm place to stand, a place to ponder the infinite and the souls who dwell above it in the sky.